I want to look at this statement from Richard Dawkins, who is considered Britain's leading intellectual and the world's number one atheist. We are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they're never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place, but who will, in fact, never see the light of day, outnumber the sand grains of Arabia. Certainly, those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively exceeds the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I in our ordinariness that are here. So we're here. He's saying he knows that possible people who don't exist could be here. Now, I have no idea how he came up with that phrase, we know this, um, because that is not knowledge. That is speculation, as we saw from T.S. Eliot. What might have been is pure speculation. Now, I, I wrote something about this in my book, which I happen to like, so I'm going to read it. Such thinking is pure CFD and is not in any way supported by the facts. Dawkins, Dawkins can calculate as many DNA combinations as he wants, and this theme runs almost ad infinitum throughout his work, but this does not mean that the possible is greater than the actual. Notice Dawkins' highly confident, confident and self-assured use of the phrase, we know. Unless Dawkins possesses supernatural powers unavailable to the rest of us, there is absolutely no way that he could know that the potential could be actual. There is no way that Dawkins could have knowledge that the unreal could be real. Dawkins is simply making the very common and illogical mistake of reifying the hypothetical. One might have expected clearer thinking from such a celebrated and influential figure. And then I ask Dawkins and others to go look at what T.S. Eliot wrote, which is about the abstraction remaining a perpetual possibility only in a world of speculation. Um, and in no way can this imaginary world of abstraction, which, which Dawkins is involved in, be considered knowledge. Now, I mentioned actualism earlier. Actualism, the, meaning the actual is the only possibility, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later also, means, if that's true, that means that Darwinism would be defunct and a mockery. And we're going to look at the work of probably the world's number two atheist named Daniel Dennett, who wrote Darwin's Dangerous Idea. If actualism were true, Darwinism would be defunct, utterly incapable of explaining any of the apparent design in the biosphere. It would be as if you wrote a chess playing computer program that could play one game by rote and mirabil dictu, it regularly won against all competition. This would be a pre-established harmony of miraculous proportions it would make a mockery of the Darwinian claim to have an explanation of how the winning moves have been found. So if the actual is the only possibility, that whole idea of scientists greater than Newton, poets greater than Keats, that is total illusion. And we are here because we're supposed to be here, because of the actualism. All that what might have been that cloud of uncertainty gets reduced to the here and now. That's why he says it would be defunct and would make a mockery of Darwinism. So lottery thinking and what might have been, that's pretend and make-believe. That's all over the work of Richard Dawkins. He said in his book that it's overwhelmingly probable that you are dead because of all the eons and eons and all the combinations of genes and all the potential people, the fact that you're here in 2008, you really shouldn't be here, you know, because you, quote unquote, should have been born in 1900, or you should have been born in 2000, or you should have been born not at all. And he starts talking about your grandparents said to meet, your parents said to meet, as if that's all by chance. He says, the, the thread of historical events by which our existence hangs is wincingly tenuous. Because we're supposed to feel, hey, you know, if my parents hadn't met, I wouldn't be here. And, uh, and my grandparents had to meet. And my great-great-grandparents had to meet. And all those things could have been otherwise. So, so the thread of our historical existence 
is wincingly tenuous. Um, in my view, you can wince no more if you ever did so in the first place. In my view, we're here in the here and now, and that is because actualism tells us we're supposed to be here in the here and now. Now, we mentioned narrative dependent studies earlier, which, which explain why things are the way they are. And in evolutionary theory, narrative dependent studies you find that um, people say, hey, how come that thing survived and this thing didn't survive? Or how come we've got this gene and not that gene? Uh, or how come these reptiles here didn't change their stripes to survive, whereas those reptiles there did? So the thinking behind natural selection and Darwinism is adaptation and complexity. P things adapt. Something had a competitive advantage. Luck, coincidence, the appearance of design, they're all in play. Luck is a very important part of, of natural selection, as is chance. They're really related. There's bad luck and there's good luck, by the way. So if you look at studies that get published um, by evolutionary biologists, a lot of it is narrative-dependent narrative studies, trying to come up with an explanation for why something happened the way that it did. And there are lots of nasty fights in academia by, uh, among you know, competing groups that say, you know, my explanation is better than your explanation. And they're trying to say, why did, you know, why did A happen and not B? Why did the real happen and not the unreal? So they come up with all these explanations, some of which may have something to do with reality and some of which may not. But that's where you get these intellectual battles. By the way, you know what they say about battles in, in, in academia? Why are they so nasty? It's because the stakes are so low. 